everybody. Today the bookworms will continue reading Matilda by Roald Dahl and illustrated by Quentin Blake. Let's begin. Chapter 9. The Parents When Miss Honey emerged from the headmistress's study, most of the children were outside in the playground. Her first move was to go round to the various teachers who taught the senior class and borrow from them a number of textbooks. Books on algebra, geometry, French, English literature, and the like. Then she sat out Matilda and called her into the classroom. There is no point, she said, in you sitting in class doing nothing while I'm teaching the rest of the form, the two times tables and how to spell cat and rat and mouse. So during each lesson, I shall give you one of these textbooks to study. At the end of the lesson, you can come up to me with your questions if you have any, and I shall try to help you. How does that sound? Thank you, Miss Honey, Matilda said. That sounds fine. I am sure, Miss Honey said, that we will be able to get you moved into a much higher form later on. But for the moment, the headmistress wishes for you to stay where you are. Very well, Miss Honey, Matilda said. Thank you so much for getting those books for me. What a nice child she is, Miss Honey thought. I don't care what her father said about her. She seems very quiet and gentle to me, and not a bit stuck up in spite of her brilliance. In fact, she hardly seems aware of it. So when the class reassembled, Matilda went to her desk and began to study a textbook on geometry which Miss Honey had given her. The teacher kept half an eye on her all the time and noticed that the child very soon became deeply absorbed in the book. She never glanced up once during the entire lesson. Miss Honey, meanwhile, was making another decision. She was deciding that she would go herself and have a secret talk with Matilda's mother and father as soon as possible. She simply refused to let the matter rest where it was. The whole thing was ridiculous. She couldn't believe that the parents were totally unaware of their daughter's remarkable talents. After all, Mr. Mornwood was such a successful motor car dealer, so she presumed that he was a fairly intelligent man himself. In any event, parents never underestimated the abilities of their own child. Quite the reverse. Sometimes it was well nigh impossible for a teacher to convince the proud father or mother that their beloved offspring was a complete nitwit. Miss Honey felt confident that she would have no difficulty in convincing Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood that Matilda was something very special indeed. The trouble was going to be to stop them from getting over-enthusiastic. And now, Miss Honey's hopes began to expand even further. She started wondering whether permission might not be sought from the parents for her to give private tuition to Matilda after school. The prospect of coaching a child as brilliant as this appealed enormously to her professional instinct as a teacher. And suddenly, she decided that she would go and call on Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood that very evening. She would go fairly late, between 9 and 10 o'clock, when Matilda was sure to be in bed. And that is precisely what she did. Having got the address from the school records, Miss Honey set out to walk from her own home to the Wormwood's house shortly after 9. She found the house in a pleasant street where each smallish building was separated from its neighbors by a bit of garden. It was a modern brick house that could not have been cheap to buy, and the name on the gate said Cozy Nook. Nosy Cook might have been better, Miss Honey thought. She was given to playing with words in that way. She walked up the path and rang the bell, and while she stood waiting, she could hear the television blaring inside. The door was opened by a small, ratty-looking man with a thin, ratty mustache, who was wearing a sports coat that had an orange and red stripe in the material. Yes, he said, peering out at Miss Honey. If you're selling raffle tickets, I don't want any. I'm not, Miss Honey said. And please forgive me for butting in on you like this. I am Matilda's teacher at school, and it is important to have a word with you and your wife. Got into trouble already, has she? Mr. Wormwood said, blocking the doorway. Well, she's your responsibility from now on. You'll have to deal with her. She's no trouble at all, Miss Sunny said. I've come with good news about her. Quite startling news, Mr. Wormwood. Do you think I might come in for a few minutes and talk to you about Matilda? We are right in the middle of watching one of our favorite programs, Mr. Wormwood said. This is most inconvenient. Why don't you come back some other time? Miss Sunny began to lose patience. Mr. Wormwood, she said. If you think some rotten TV program is more important than your daughter's future, then you ought not to be a parent. Why don't you switch that darn thing off and listen to me? That shook Mr. Wormwood. He was not used to being spoken to in this way. 
He peered carefully at the slim, frail woman who stood so resolutely out in the porch. Oh, very well then, he snapped. Come on in and let's get over with it. Miss Honey stepped briskly inside. Mrs. Wormwood isn't going to thank you for this, the man said, as he led her into the sitting room, where a large plantanium blonde woman was gazing rapturously at the TV screen. Who is it? the woman said, not looking round. Some school teacher, Mr. Wormwood said. She says she'd got to talk to us about Matilda. He crossed to the TV set and turned down the sound, but left the picture on the screen. Don't do that, Harry, Mrs. Wormwood cried out. Willard is just about to propose to Angelica. You can still watch you while we're talking, Mr. Wormwood said. This is Matilda's teacher. She says she's got some sort of news to give us. My name is Jennifer Honey, Miss Honey said. How do you do, Mrs. Wormwood? Mrs. Wormwood glared at her and said, What's the trouble then? Nobody invited Miss Honey to sit down, so she chose a chair and sat down anyway. This, she said, was your daughter's first day at school. We know that, Mrs. Wormwood said, ratty about her missing her program. Is that all you came to tell us? Miss Honey stared hard into the other woman's wet gray eyes, and she allowed the silence to hang in there until Mrs. Wormwood became uncomfortable. Do you wish me to explain why I came, she said. Get on with it then, Mrs. Wormwood said. I'm sure you know, Miss Honey said, that children in the bottom class at school are not expected to be able to read or spell or juggle with numbers when they first arrive. Five-year-olds cannot do that. But Matilda can do it all. And if I am to believe her, I wouldn't, Mrs. Wormwood said. She was still ratty at losing the sound on the TV. Was she lying then, Miss Honey said. When she told me that nobody taught her to multiply or to read? Did either of you teach her? Teach her what? Mr. Wormwood said. To read. To read books, Miss Honey said. Perhaps you did teach her. Perhaps she was lying. Perhaps you have shelves full of books all over the house. I wouldn't know. Perhaps you are both great readers. Of course we read, Mr. Wormwood said. Don't be so daft. I read the auto car and the motor from cover to cover every week. This child has already read an astonishing number of books, Miss Honey said. I was simply trying to find out if she came from a family that loved good literature. We don't hold with book reading, Mr. Wormwood said. You can't make a living from sitting on your fanny and reading storybooks. We don't keep them in the house. I see, Miss Honey said. Well, all I came to tell you was that Matilda has a brilliant mind. But I expect you knew all that already. Of course I knew she could read, the mother said. She spends her life up in her room buried in some silly book. But doesn't it not intrigue you, Miss Honey said, that a little five-year-old is reading long adult novels by Dickens and Hemingway? Doesn't that make you jump up and down with excitement? Not particularly, the mother said. I'm not in favor of blue stocking girls. A girl should think about making herself look attractive so she can get a good husband later on. Looks is more important than books, Miss Hunky. The name is Honey, Miss Honey said. Now look at me, Mrs. Wormwood said. Then look at you. You chose books, I chose looks. Miss Honey looked at the plain, plump person with the smug, suet, putting face who was sitting across the room. What did you say, she asked? I said, you chose books and I chose looks, Mrs. Wormwood said. And who's finishing up the better off? Me, of course. I'm sitting pretty in a nice house with a successful businessman, and you're left slaving away, teaching a lot of nasty little children the ABC. Quite right, Sugar Plum, Mr. Wormwood said, casting a look of such simpering sloppiness at his wife, it would have made a cat sick. Miss Honey decided that if she was going to get anywhere with these people, she must not lose her temper. I haven't told you all of it, she said. Matilda, so far as I can gather, at this early stage, is also a kind of a mathematical genius. She can multiply complicated figures in her head like lightning. What's the point of that when you can buy a calculator, Mr. Wormwood said. A girl doesn't get a man by being brainy, Mrs. Wormwood said. Look at the film star, for instance, she added, pointing at the silent TV screen, where a bossy female was being embraced by a craggy actor in the moonlight. You don't think he got him to do that by multiplying figures at him, do you? Not likely. And now he's going to marry her. You see, if he doesn't, 
and she's going to live in a mansion with a butler and lots of maids. Miss Honey could hardly believe what she was hearing. She had heard that parents like this existed all over the place, and that their children turned out to be delinquents and dropouts. But it was still a shock to meet a pair of them in the flesh. Matilda's trouble, she said, trying once again, is that she is so far ahead of everyone else around her that it might be worth thinking about some extra kind of private tuition. I seriously believe that she could be brought up to university standard in two or three years with a proper coaching. University, Mr. Wormwood shouted, bouncing up in his chair. Who wants to go to university, for heaven's sake? I learned there is bad habits. That is not true, Miss Honey said. If you had a heart attack this minute and had to call a doctor, that doctor would be university graduate. If you got sued for selling someone a rotten second-hand car, you'd have to get a lawyer, and he'd be a university graduate, too. Do not despise clever people, Mr. Wormwood. But I can see we are not going to agree. I'm sorry I burst in on you like this. Miss Honey rose from her chair and walked out of the room. Mr. Wormwood followed her to the front door and said, Good of you to come, Miss Hawks. Or is it Miss Harris? It is neither, Miss Honey said. But let it go. And away she went. Chapter 10. Throwing the Hammer The nice thing about Matilda was that if you had met her casually and talked to her, you would have thought she was a perfectly normal five-and-a-half-year-old child. She displayed almost no outward signs of her brilliance, and she never showed off. This is a very sensible and quiet little girl, you would have said to yourself. And unless for some reason you had started a discussion with her about literature or mathematics, you would never have known the extent of her brain power. It was therefore easy for Matilda to make friends with other children. All those in her class liked her. They knew, of course, that she was clever because they had heard her being questioned by Miss Honey on the first day of term. And they knew also that she was allowed to sit quietly with a book during lessons and not pay attention to the teacher. But children of their age do not search deeply for reasons. They are far too wrapped up in their own small struggles to worry over much about what others are doing and why. Among Matilda's newfound friends was the girl called Lavender. Right from the first day of term, the two of them started wandering around together during the morning break and in the lunch hour. Lavender was exceptionally small for her age, a skinny little nymph with deep brown eyes and with dark hair that was cut in fringe across her forehead. Matilda liked her because she was gusty and adventurous. She liked Matilda for the exact same reasons. Before the first week of term was up, awesome tales about the headmistress, Miss Trunchbull, began to filter through to the newcomers. Matilda and Lavender, standing in a corner of the playground during morning break on the third day, were approached by a rugged ten-year-old with a boil on her nose, called Hortensia. New scum, I suppose, Hortensia said to them, looking down from a great height. She was eating from an extra-large bag of potato crisps and digging the stuff out in handfuls. Welcome to Bortzel, she added, spraying bits of crisp out of her mouth like snowflakes. The two tiny ones confronted by this giant kept a watchful silence. Have you met the trench bull yet? Hortensia asked. We've seen her at prayers, Lavender said, but we haven't met her. You've got a treat coming to you, Hortensia said. She hates very small children. She therefore loathes the bottom class and everyone in it. She thinks five-year-olds are grubs that haven't yet hatched out. In went another fistful of crisps, and when she spoke again, out sprayed the crumbs. If you survive your first year, you may just manage to live through the rest of your time here. But many don't survive. They get carried out on stretchers screaming. I've seen it often. Hortensia paused to observe the effect of these remarks were having on the two titchy ones. Not very much. They seemed pretty cool. So the large one decided to regale them with further information. I suppose you know the Trunchbull has a lockup cupboard in her private quarters called the Chokey. Have you heard about the Chokey? Matilda and Lavender shook their heads and continued to gaze up at the giant. Being very small, they were inclined to mistrust any creature that was larger than they were, especially senior girls. The Chokey, Hortensia went on, is a very tall but very narrow cupboard. The floor is only 10 inches square, so you can sit down or squat in it. You have to stand, 
and three of the walls are made of cement with bits of broken glass sticking out all over, so you can't lean against them. You have to stand more or less at attention all the time when you get locked up in there. It's terrible. Can you lean against the door? Matilda asked. Don't be daft, Hortensia said. Their door has got thousands of sharp spiky nails sticking out of it. They've been hammered through from the outside, probably by the trench bull herself. Have you ever been in there? Lavender asked. My first term. I was in there six times, Hortensia said. Twice for a whole day, and the other times for two hours each. But two hours is quite bad enough. It's pitch dark, and you have to stand up dead straight. And if you wobble at all, you get spiked, either by the glass, on the walls, or the nails on the door. Why were you put in? Matilda asked. What have you done? The first time, Hortensia said, I poured half a tin of golden syrup onto the seat of the chair that Trunchbull was going to sit on at prayers. It was wonderful. When she lowered herself into the chair, there was a loud squelching noise similar to that made by a hippopotamus when lowering its foot into the mud on the banks of the Limpopo River. But you're too small and stupid to have read the just so stories, aren't you? I read them, Matilda said. You're a liar, Hortensia said amiably. You can't even read yet, but no matter. So when the trunchbull sat down on the golden syrup, the squelch was beautiful. And when she jumped up again, the chair sort of stuck to the seat of those awful green breeches she wears and came up with her for a few seconds until the thick syrup slowly came unstuck. Then she clasped her hands to the seat of her breeches and both hands got covered in the muck. You should have heard her below. But how did she know it was you? Lavender asked. A little squirt called Ollie Bogwhistle sneaked on me, Hortensia said. I knocked his front teeth out. And the Trunchbull put you in the chokey for a whole day? Mm, Matilda's gulping. All day long, Hortensia said. I was off my rocker when she let me out. I was babbling like an idiot. What were the other things you did to get put in the chokey? Lavender asked. Oh, I can't remember them all now, Hortensia said. She spoke with the air of an old warrior who has been so in many battles that bravery has become commonplace. It's all so long ago, she added, stuffing more crisps into her mouth. Ah, yes, I can remember one. Here's what happened. I chose a time when I knew the trench bowl was out of the way teaching the sixth formers, and I put up my hand and asked to go to the bogs. But instead of going there, I sneaked into the trench bowl's room, and after a speedy search, I found the drawer where she kept all her gym snickers. Go on, Matilda said spellbound. What happened next? I had sent away by post. You see, for this very powerful itching powder, Hortensia said, it cost 50 label and it was made from the powder teeth of deadly snakes and it was guaranteed to raise welts the size of walnuts on your skin. So I sprinkled the stuff inside every pair of snickers in the drawer and then folded them all up again carefully. Hortensia paused to cram more crisps into her mouth. Did it work? Lavender asked. Well, Hortensia said. A few days later, during prayers, the trunchbull suddenly started scratching herself like mad down below. Aha, I said to myself. Here we go. She changed for Jim already. It was pretty wonderful to be sitting there watching it all and knowing that I was the only person in the whole school who realized exactly what was going on inside the Trunchbull's pants. And I felt safe too. I knew I couldn't be caught. Then the scratching got worse. She couldn't stop. She must have thought she had a wasp's nest down there. And then, right in the middle of the Lord's prayers, she leaped up and grabbed her bottom and rushed out of the room. Both Matilda and Lavender were enthralled. It was quite clear to them that they were at this moment standing in the presence of a master. Here was somebody who had brought the art of skull degree to the highest point of perfection. Somebody, moreover, who was willing to risk life and limb in pursuit of her calling. They gazed in wonder at this goddess, and suddenly even the boil on her nose was no longer a blemish, but a badge of courage. But how did she catch you that time? 
Lavender asked breathless with wonder. She didn't, Hortensia said. But I got a day in the chokey just the same. Why? they both asked. The Trunchbull, Hortensia said, has a nasty habit of guessing. When she doesn't know who the culprit is, she makes a guess at it. And the trouble is, she's often right. I was the prime suspect this time because of the golden syrup job. And although I knew she didn't have any proof, nothing I said made any difference. I kept shouting, How could I have done it, Miss Trunchbull? I didn't even know you kept any spare Snickers at school. I didn't even know what itching powder is. I've never heard of it. But the line didn't help me in spite of the great performance I put on. The Trunchbull simply grabbed me by one ear and rushed me to the chokey at the double and threw me inside and locked the door. That was my second all-day stretch. It was absolute torture. I was spiked and cut all over when I came out. It's like a war, Matilda said, overawed. You're darn right it's like war, Hortensia cried. And the casualties are terrific. We are the Crusaders and the gallant army fighting for our lives with hardly any weapons at all. And the Trunchbull is the Prince of Darkness, the foul serpent, the fiery dragon with all the weapons at her command. It's a tough life. We all try to support each other. You can rely on us, Lavender said, making her height of three feet two inches stretch as tall as possible. No, I can't, Hortensia said. You're only shrimps, but you never know. We may find a use for you one day in some undercover job. Tell us a little bit more about what she does, Matilda said. Please do. I mustn't frighten you before you've been here a week, Hortensia said. You won't, Lavender said. We may be small, but we're quite tough. Listen to this then, Hortensia said. Only yesterday, the Trunchbull caught a boy called Julius Rotwinkle eating a licorice all sorts during the scripture lesson. And she simply picked him up by one arm and flung him clear out of the open classroom window. Our classroom is one floor up and we saw Julius Rotwinkle going sailing out over the garden like a frisbee and landing with a thump in the middle of the lettuces. Then the Trunchbull turned to us and said, From now on, anybody caught eating in class goes straight out the window. Did this Julius Rottingwinkle break any bones? Lavender asked. Only a few, Hortensia said. You've got to remember that the Trunchbull once threw the hammer for Britain in the Olympics, so she's very proud of her right arm. What's throwing the hammer? Lavender asked. The hammer, Hortensia said, is actually a ready great cannonball on the end of a long bit of wire, and the throw whisks it around and round on his or her head faster and faster and then lets it go. You have to be terrifically strong. The Trunchbull would throw anything around just to keep her arm in, especially children. Good heavens, Lavender said. I once heard her say, Hortensia went on, that a large boy is about the same weight as an Olympic hammer, and therefore he's very useful for practicing with. At that point, something strange happened. The playground, which up to then had been filled... With shrieks and the shouting of children at play, all at once became silent as the grave. Watch out, Hortensia whispered. Matilda and Lavender glanced round and round and saw the gigantic figure of Miss Trunchbull advancing through the crowd of boys and girls with menacing strides. The children drew back hastily to let her through and her progress across this asphalt was like the Moses going through the Red Sea. When the waters parted, a formidable figure, she was too, in her belted smock and green breeches. Below the knees, her calf muscles stood out like grapefruits inside her stockings. Amanda Thrip, she was shouting. You Amanda Thrip, come here. Hold your hat, Hortensia whispered. What's going to happen? Lavender whispered back. That idiot Amanda, Hortensia said has let her long hair grow even longer during the holes, and her mother was plaited into pigtails. Silly thing to do. Why silly? Matilda asked. If there's one thing the Trunchbull can't stand, it's pigtails, Hortensia said. Matilda and Lavender saw the giant in green breeches advancing upon a girl about ten who had a pair of plaited golden pigtails hanging over her shoulders. 
Each pigtail had a blue satin bow at the end of it, and it all looked very pretty. The girl wearing the pigtails, Amanda Thrip, stood quite still, watching the advancing giant. And the expression on her face was once that you might have found on the face of a person who was trapped in a small field with an enlarged bull which is charging flat out towards her. The girl was glued to the spot, terror-struck, pop-eyed, quivering, knowing for certain that the day of judgment had come for her at last. Miss Trunchbull had now reached the victim and stood towering over her. I want those filthy pigtails off before you come back to school tomorrow, she barked. Chop them off and throw them in the dustbin. You understand? Amanda, paralyzed with fright, managed to stutter. My mummy likes them. She plates for them me every morning. Your mummy's a twit, the trench bellowed. She pointed a finger the size of a salami at the child's head and shouted. You'll look like a rat with a tail coming out of its head. My mummy thinks I look lovely. Miss Trunchbull, Amanda stuttered, shaking like a blank mage. I don't give a tinker's toot what your mummy thinks, the Trunchbull yelled. And with that, she lunged forward and grabbed hold of Amanda's pigtails in her right fist and lifted the girl clear off the ground. Then she started swinging her around and round her head faster and faster. And Amanda was screaming blue murder and the trunch bull was yelling, I'll give you pigtails, you little rat! Shades of the Olympics, Hortensia murmured. She's getting up speed, now like she does with the hammer. Ten to one, she's going to throw her. And now the trunch bull was leaning back against the weight of the whirling girl and pivoting expertly her toes. Spinning round and round, and soon Amanda Thrip was traveling so fast she became a blur, and suddenly with a mighty grunt, the trunch bull let go of the pigtails, and Amanda went sailing like a rocket right over the wire fence of the playground and high up into the sky. Well thrown, sir, someone shouted from across the playground, and Matilda was mesmerized by the holy crazy affair. Saw Amanda Thrip descending in a long, graceful parabola onto the playing field beyond. She landed on the grass and bounced three times and finally came to rest. Then, amazingly, she sat up. She looked a trifle dazed, and who could blame her? But after a minute or so, she was on her feet again and tottering back towards the playground. The trench bull stood in the playground, dusting off her hands. Not bad, she said, considering I'm not in strict training. Not bad at all. Then she strode away. She's mad, Hortensia said. But don't the parents complain, Matilda asked. Would yours, Hortensia asked. I know mine wouldn't. She treats the mothers and fathers just the same as the children, and they're all scared to death of her. I'll be seeing you sometime. You too. And with that, she sauntered away. That's it for today. I hope you guys enjoy. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe for more read-alongs. Until next time, bye!